Welcome back to our conversation with Emily Graham. I'm your host, Lloyd Hopkins, Executive Director of Million Dollar Teacher Project, and we are back in the Teacher's Lounge, and this is Chapter 3. One thing I want to go back to is with the with the social media stuff, which is because I'm a parent, and um, and and to me, there is a dance because my so my daughter's 14 and she does have social media. I try to keep her active so she's not spending a lot of time on it. Like so she goes to school, then she goes to gymnastics and then she get and then she gets home, does her homework. Then she's on her social media. Right. Um, we and we try to make sure we monitor and have restrictions and, and 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 follow her pages so we know what they what she's doing. But kids can you know, kids are going to figure out loopholes and workarounds and do little sneaky stuff, set up another profile. And you didn't know they set up a profile. Yeah, you're thin stuff. You know, those type of things. But the, the 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 dance in it for me is that I want, that I feel like this is the world kids are going to inherit. This is their world. This technology, social media is going to be a part of their world. And so they do need to learn how to deal with it. And what that also means is they also have to learn how to shut it off. They also have to learn how to compartmentalize it and not allow it to uh, take over their life. You know, they also have to, the fact that we are so attached to these things and it has changed how we socialize and interact, they also have to learn how to practice self-care. You know, we got to teach kids that type of stuff early where I didn't even start learning those concepts till I was 30, you know, about mental health and taking care of myself. We got to start teaching kids about mental health earlier and, 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 and teach them how not to live for the likes and how real interaction is so much more important. But these are concepts and things that we didn't even have to think of. You know, I know you didn't, I know you in your generation, you started coming to this stuff a little bit more, but, but, but again, but there's always, societal things we have to think about you know like when i was a kid the don't talk to strangers and and all of that kind of stuff that we're trying to prepare for um and now it's social media but it is it's such a and and it's and it's hard you know it's hard to really figure out the the right approach um what i try to do is just keep them busy keep them active and and try to teach them how to properly manage Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to do. And I'm sure a lot of parents needed to hear that on how, you know, you help keep your kid in that healthy balance of maybe still having a social media account, but balancing it with like real life stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I also but again, I do think it would be a it's not a bad idea for classrooms to look at how do we make a social media element to our classroom? you know Um, and, and so speaking of that with 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 new world problems. And 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 how do schools adapt and adjust? We're dealing with a freaking pandemic, you know. Where and and again, there like we said earlier, there was no rule book, there was no playbook for this, and and now you're having to go to school and try to prepare for mm-hmm. a class brand new world for a brand new world that we're that's still unfolding. Like this Mm -hmm. brand new world is like we're like there's going to be a world pre COVID-19 and post COVID-19. And so we don't even know what the post COVID-19 world looks like. We're seeing little glimpses, but we don't know. And so there's so much uncertainty and you still have to prepare kids to learn. You still have to Mm -hmm. prepare your classroom. How are you handling that? Has your school decided to go virtual online? How is your school handling it? And how are you approaching it as a teacher? Yeah, so um, I was really grateful that my school took this approach. They are operating for two weeks as the governor ordered until August 17th, exclusively online. And I think that's gonna be a good buffer period for us to look at the COVID data in Arizona and ask ourselves truly, is it safe for kids to come in person, even if we make all of these adjustments, even if everyone wears masks, even if we're socially distanced, um, which will be hard to do if it's all students, but even with all those precautions, is it safe? Um, So I think my school has done a really great job at being as proactive as possible about those things. They have a plan. Um, The thing that is frustrating and that we can't plan for is what does the data show? So I think it was either yesterday or Saturday, um, 
the Department of Education made a post um, that said that on August 14th, they were going to have that data prepared. Those metrics um, that would allow communities to say, yes, we are prepared for in-person instruction or no, it's not safe here yet. Um, so that that's a pretty hard deadline to adhere to because it's 10 days from now, but you know, like that, our whole plan could change. Right. I could not be seeing students in person on August 17th and we could be exclusively online. Um, and I, I think as teachers, we were prepared for this at least a little bit. I think it's the families who are really suffering through all of this, you know, like I feel really bad for families who depend on schools for things like childcare, meals, um, things like that, who are being told, sorry, we won't know for another 10 days. And even then, you know, it might not go the way you want it to. So, sorry, we're just doing the best we can. Well, and that's such a great point because so many families um, don't have the option to be able to stay at home with their kid, you know, right. and, to, and to also be the teacher that so many um, student that so many um, families have had to do this past summer towards the end of the last school year um, and and really depend on their school. And, and also those same parents don't necessarily have the luxury to choose whether to send their kid in person or not. They may not want their kid to go back, you know, and would right. prefer for it to be virtual, but they're not in a position to do so. So now they have to send their kid, you know, and it's such a, it's such a tough, tough situation. Um, mm -hmm. a meme that I've been seeing going around where it's, um, and I wish I could find it, but there's like a, it's a picture and it shows desks separated by a partition and it, and um, that a teach and basically the teacher had to go out and buy all this stuff theirself to, to sanitize their classroom and try to keep their students safe. Uh, the trouble for me in that is teachers already have to go out of their pocket just to buy classroom supplies in the normal world. And I can, and I can't even imagine having teachers having now be in the position to not only buy supplies for their class, but also buy supplies to uh, make your classroom COVID-19 safe. Like that's, that's so difficult. Are you all having to do that kind of stuff or? No, we've been very lucky in the fact that our school has supplied us with a really great industrial grade disinfectant, hand sanitizers. They installed two hand sanitizing stations in our classroom. They even installed new water fountains that, you know, you don't have to touch to activate. Um, so I think my school has done a really good job at, in bolstering the facilities with supplies and bolstering teachers with supplies. Um, I think the question on everyone's minds isn't so much though, like, how am I going to get this stuff? It's, is it safe enough? Because I, I will be honest, I don't feel completely confident that even with distancing, even with masks, even with contactless water bottle stations, and even with hand sanitizing pumps everywhere, that it's going to be safe enough. We're going to have outbreaks. People are going to get sick. And I'm glad that the school is taking those precautions, but I mean, Teachers and students and families are going to have to be ready and be okay with the fact that outbreaks are going to happen. And I don't want that to be our normal, you know? <laughs> and you know, the, the thing, like kids get sick in general, like on a normal schools can be germ, germ stations. Well, I got weapons grade flu the first time I, like the first year I was teaching, like the stuff that inculcates among student groups is unlike any illness you will get anywhere well, else. The, hold on, that was a teacher word. Uh, you said what, inculcates? Inculcates, yeah, it's like, it's like it's brewing, like percolating, yeah. but more sinister. Word of the day, inculcates, <laughs> okay. Um, but but you're exactly right, like, and, and so many people when, um, cause, it, and, and that happens, like the first day of school, first week of school, first month of school, you'll see kids getting sick. Uh, anybody who's new, in like a like a new teacher or a new volunteer that goes onto the school, well, a lot of times they'll they'll come down with a cold or something because your 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 body has to build up an immune <laughs> has to build up its immune system to to survive in that environment. And so that's that's in the regular world prior to all of this, you know. So it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to manage. Um, the other thing that is going on in this world is. 
a lot of the civil unrest uh, um, that was caused after the murder of George Floyd, you know, and and that has led to this national conversation around Black Lives Matter and and equity and equality uh, in the community and in dismantling systems of unjust of injustice. Um, and I feel like our school systems play a huge part in that. They can and and, and they, this education is the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. um, they can reinforce some of these things or they can dismantle some of these things um, if, if, if the education system is properly equipped with the tools it needs. Mm -hmm. um, and so with this conversation and, and with all of this going on, there's also conversations around inequity in, edu in our curriculum, you know, um, and, 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 and having a diverse curriculum uh, that represents a diverse population of students. How how are you approaching that? I'm so glad you asked. I, I worked super hard on, hard on this since day one. Um, so the first two years of my career, I was an English teacher. And the beauty of being an English teacher is that you can do anything. Like there are so many topics that you can approach as being an English subject. Um, and what that looked like for me was completely throwing away the recommended reading list from my school. Um, I think a lot of schools, still have this mentality that I hate where it's like, we have to use classical texts. Mm. And that's, I mean, the reality is that many classical texts are written by white men. And not that that's something that we shouldn't study. It's, it's incredibly important to study literature of that ethnic and that um, gender group. But the reality is that most, if not all, of our students are not white men, you know? <laughs> so um, I'm really diligent in including um, literature from people of color, literature from people who are non-binary, who are LGBTQIA, because, you know, um, the reality of our world is now that people are not conforming to those boxes that they used to, and that kids are going to encounter people who are transgender, who are low income, or they themselves identify that way. And it's important that we show kids that people with these identities are successful and do have a voice, you know, not as much as they should right now. Um, you know, a lot of research shows that um, people of color are not as well represented in many industries um, in America. And I really want kids to know, like, people who look, sound, live like you, they're successful. And a lot of the curriculum that schools have carried over for even five or 10 years does not represent that. Because just like you said, um, the political climate and the conversations that we're having about race, about sexuality, about rights, about freedoms did not exist 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, yeah. so um, I really want kids to see themselves as participants in that conversation and engage with texts and topics um, that are relevant to today's conversations about those things. And it does, it's not just for English, you know, like um, this year I, I am so, so lucky to be teaching all subjects. And I really wanna talk about, um, you know, how does capitalism influence science? You know, like if you can't get your study funded, what happens to your study? You know, in a, in a free market, um, only the topics that are seen as profitable or, you know, worthy in our capitalistic system are gonna get funded. So um, it's not just English that you can apply it to. I mean, I actually posted to Facebook, I'll hit you with the link later, um, <laughs> about this. Someone made this great post about how you can be culturally relevant across all subjects, ranging from art, English, um, foreign languages, PE, like it's awesome. Please share that. Share. Yes. When we put this out, I want to put that out with this uh, because you're, because you're exactly right. Representation matters in all formats. It's not just English. It's not just uh, math. You know, it's it's all subjects. And really thinking about how do we make this inclusive and how do we use these topics to really show kids how to impact the world that they that they live in. You know, empower them with the tools to to know the part that they play and can play, and that they don't have to just be victims of the world. They can also be a part of creating the world, and it and it and it really takes learning all those things and infusing that information across subjects. So I think that's brilliant that that you're doing that. I think your kids are, are lucky 
to have you. Um, and I hope more teachers are looking at that and getting outside of their comfort zones because this is a time for us to be bold, courageous, yeah. and, be, and most importantly, be intentional. Be intentional yeah. about embracing um, some other approaches, other ideas, uh, some other experts that maybe you didn't learn about, you know, um, because you weren't taught through your formal education and being open and, and really going out and seeking some of this good stuff because there's good stuff out there. So please, please search it and find it. It benefits our students. Coming up next week, more with our fantastic conversation with Emily Graham inside of the Teacher's Lounge.